We're doing a team effort uh, this morning. So my name's uh, Ryan Sterry. I'm a, a regional dairy educator in northwest corner of Wisconsin. Uh, also with us today is Amanda Kaufman, who's a regional livestock educator to the south, southwest corner of Wisconsin. So we got the Mississippi River door um, covered for Wisconsin today. Uh, and also joining us is Denise Schwab, uh, regional beef uh, extension specialist of Iowa State uh, University. And as we're going along here, uh, we do have some slides, but we also want this to be conversational, uh, not quite as formal presentations we maybe do for some uh, events. Uh, so Denise, Amanda, and myself, we're going to kick it off. Uh, but if you want to uh, type questions in the chat as we go, by all means, do that. You don't have to wait until the end. Um, and we have a helper or two that's going to help us uh, read through those questions um, as we go. Um, so with that, we can just jump right in. Uh, so. This is the first of four sessions on beef on dairy uh, that uh, we're organizing for this March tour today and two coming up uh, two weeks from now. And we'll touch on those uh, at the very end of what's coming up for programming. We thought um, since we're covering birth to harvest, uh, birth starts with conception, right? So picking the right sires uh, and getting a good uh, start that way is how we wanted to kick off this series. So with that, uh, we did want to start a little bit uh, about the Holstein steer. Um, even though that we're talking more about beef and dairy crosses, we do want to emphasize there are positive aspects about Holstein steers. It's not all bad news about them. Uh, it's uh, more about how do we improve upon uh, maybe where they don't perform as well as their full beef uh, native blood counterparts uh, and start our sire selection there on uh, complementing the weaknesses of uh, the dairy uh, influence and how to get closer to that beef standard. So with that, uh, Amanda, Denise, I know you had a few comments on here, uh, something we've talked about a lot on car rides, right? Very much so. So we do want to kind of note that the Holstein steer isn't necessarily a bad animal in itself when it comes to um, an animal when sent to the rail. The Holstein steer has great characteristics as far as having um, quality grades that are very close to some of their um, straight beef counterparts, as well as having less external fat on the outside of, of those ribeyes. They also tend to have similar taste and um, tenderness profiles as compared to some of their, their straight beef um, cohorts. Um, some of the limitations that they do have, however, um, well, I'll go ahead and let Denise kind of talk about those. Sure, and, and actually before I jump to that, I'm just gonna make a note well, you guys did a really good job in Wisconsin on this um, um, paper that I think you have scanned in the URL or the, the code up there on, on what are those traits and, and strengths and weaknesses of the finished um, dairy beef. Um, you know, I, I think one of the great things about them is that they're so consistent. Um, you've had such a tight breeding program in the Holstein breed in the last several decades that um, most guys that finish Holsteins really like that consistency. But, but part of the reason that we're talking so much about beef on dairy is, you know, a few years ago when um, a number of our packers said they weren't going to buy any Holstein steers anymore, that really pushed us to look for what are some other options, because when there's only one buyer in the market, that discount went from, you know, five to 12 to 15 bucks, a hundred to somewhere as much as 30 and $40 a hundred weight. So it, it caused us to start looking at more. You know, as I think of the Holstein, there's there's really two big things that I think are little limitations. One is the ribeye size and shape. So um, because we can carry Holsteins to heavy weight, we can make up some of that size difference. But they always tend to have that flat, um, narrow ribeye. And so that really sets it apart, that carcass apart from beef carcasses because of that ribeye shape. The other thing, and again, because we can and do often carry them to heavy weights, is that whole mature size issue, the carcass size issue. Um, our carcasses are too heavy for the rails or too long for the rails in our traditional beef plants. And so those are probably two of the biggest issues that I think as we select beef bulls, we wanna really target in on how do we change that component of the dairy steer. And I think Denise you just touched on this, this is, um, one of many images out there, but uh, looking at that ribeye area, um, both maybe more so the difference in shape here than size. Um, mm -hmm. 
But yeah, definitely. I know you want to keep going on, you know, kind of how traits we want to look at improving and how we start going about that. Yeah. So, and, and I think, like you said, this is the, the, the image on the left is the Holstein ribeye. The image on the right is the beef ribeye. And so you can see that difference in shape. And so the more we can do to change that shape, some of that goes with muscle expression. So I think we have a picture to look at a little later that talks about that, that, uh, rump structure and the muscle structure on there. That's one of the things we really want to change. Um, from a, a quality standpoint, though, like Amanda said, um, Holstein steers grade really well. Um, part of that is that tight genetic base um, that gets us marbling in the muscle. And part of it is how we feed them. You know, we feed corn from very young ages on, so their marbling score should be better. And so a lot of times as we look at selecting a beef bull, we'll kind of say we want to do no harm in terms of marbling scores because the Holsteins really do marble very well. But again, that Holstein frame size, that mature size, that body length and height, those are the things that we need to look at. How do we limit that? Um, jerseys, uh, you know, and Amanda, you can maybe address jerseys more, but they're kind of just the opposite. Yeah, exactly. So when when we're breeding those jerseys, we want growth. We want to increase that carcass weight. We want to increase, you know, potential feed efficiency and, and growth in general. Um, whereas our Holsteins on the other end, they're, they're a little bit different. So the bulls that we're talking about for Holsteins aren't necessarily going to be the same bulls that we talk about for the, those Jersey cows. Um, and one thing that we want to kind of touch base on, you know, what is the goal for these dairy beef cross animals is that we want to attract additional buyers um, and not just Holstein market buyers. You know, we really want to be able to stress to you guys that we want to be adding value by having more of these animals placed into those straight beef markets. Um, you may even be able to hit some of those value added markets such as CAB. And we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Right. And a couple other things we have on there is we can get um, homozygous pulled bulls in almost every breed. And that is a huge advantage in the, in the feedlot industry to have those, those naturally pulled bulls and not have to worry about horns. Um, the other thing is, as you mentioned, Amanda, trying to hit those higher value markets. So specifically thinking about that certified Angus beef market, because it's a high quality market, probably, you know, on the low side, $2, a hundred weight uh, premiums on the high side, maybe almost eight to 10. And some of these critters are able to do that. They are very much so. But, but again, remember the, the guidelines for that CAB is a, a predominantly black hide. You know, they can have mm -hmm. white in front of the shoulders and below the, the um, flank and still qualify, but they have to have beef characteristics. So they have to have that ribeye shape. Um, they, they have to have the marbling, at least average choice or higher on marbling score. Um, there are some, they have to have at least a minimum size of ribeye and, and a minimum uh, maximum um, amount of fat. Um, but we can get that black hair coat um, from a lot of different breeds. We've got those homozygous black bulls in a lot of breeds in addition to Angus. And maybe just a quick point of clarification. Some people know this, some don't, when you say homozygous. So cattle, you know, I have two genes for a pole for hair coat color. Homozygous means they have both. So if it's homozygous polled, that bull has two polled genes. He's guaranteed to pass on a pole gene, whereas heterozygous, they have one of each. And now you're in a 50-50 game of which gene they're gonna pass on. So that's mm -hmm. the advantage of looking at the homozygous. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I think um, that kind of dovetails into what we were uh, kind of thinking of talking about next. Uh, but again, yeah, you know, this, you know, the round, um, that external muscling, the ribeye area, those are related traits. We can kill two birds with one stone looking at that. And Ryan, I think you mentioned it when we were preparing for this last week, kind of that question of, do we make these calves beefy enough? Do they look like a beef animal, even though their dam is a dairy animal? That's kind of what our goal is. Hmm. Nope. Good point. So, so, so okay. yeah, keep going. <laughs> we'll kind of jump around. 
Um, so one of the things that when it comes to selecting sires is to think about what's your marketing program. And so I think it, it has a huge impact. Are we selling those day to week old calves? Um, that's kind of one market. If we're selling direct into uh, finishing them all out and selling on a, a live weight basis is kind of another market. And if we're finishing them out and then selling them on a grid um, with carcass merit, then that's kind of another priority we want to look at in terms of what sires do we start to select to make the best choice on, on those calves. Um, the one thing that I always stress, though, um, to a lot of our folks is if all we're doing is making a black Holstein carcass, we're not helping the industry or ourselves. So the, the advantage comes when we can sell these cattle into our traditional commodity beef or our specialty beef or our certified programs as beef cattle. But they have, we have to change that muscle shape and, and structure in order to do that. And I think that's why we wanted to bring the marketing up here uh, a little bit earlier uh, in the discussion. Um, because even because we do talk to a lot of producers, they're all over the board, right? You know, selling wet calves, feeders, doing some, you know, finishing their own runs a gamut, right? So I think what we really want to emphasize and get people to think about, even if you are that dairy farm that's selling wet calves, day old calves, whatnot, there's still some value in doing sire selection for what you just said about what the perception of these animals is going to be in the industry. Do they maintain this value added they have now over the straight Holsteins one year, three years, five years from now, or does this get labeled as a fad um, when you look back at it in history? Um, but you can vary your you know, selection criteria, right? So that might just be you know, looking at you know, terminal index we'll talk about later. Um, but if you are retaining these animals, you really do have um, an advantage to yourself to select some traits like um, growth or car, you know, depending on when you're marketing them. And you have, if you're retaining your own animals, you gain that knowledge of how they perform. You have a little bit inside information after you get established doing this um, versus, you know, randomly picking out animals from the sale barn or whatnot, um, where you don't have quite as much background info on them. You don't know what the genetics behind them are. Anything um, more you want to add to that? I, I would say we've got um, our beef breeds have done a nice job of creating some terminal indexes or um, that focus on the finishing end, the, the end product. And I think that becomes our first sort anytime we're looking at um, sire selection. And then, like you said, we can pick those one or two or three other traits that might add us more value depending on our end market. So, so one thing... Oh, sorry. Yep. So the one thing we do kind of want to emphasize on, and I think it was one of those things that we definitely touched base on on that fact sheet um, that we were talking about earlier is that most beef breeds have sires with potential to do what we want, um, regardless if we're talking about using it on a Holstein cow or a Jersey cow, breed doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but finding that bull within the breed that we want to use is kind of more of what we need to be looking at. Um, but there's also sires within breed, within these breeds that can do damage to our goal as well. Um, right. So, you know, you put in here that, that there's, there's sires that can, can fail. And in some cases, those would be those that don't add much muscle shape or add too much, too much growth to the Holsteins. You know, those are the ones that are a problem for us. So not every black bull is the same. Um, the other thing is we have so much more variation within a beef breed today than we did decades ago that we can find good and bad bulls for our priorities in every breed. Um, kind of a phrase we've used is today's breeds are not the same as our dad's or our granddad's bulls or breeds. And I think we our next slide is going to kind of show us that that um, this is from the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, and it's looking at genetic trend for yearling weight of our different various um, beef breeds. And basically what this is looking at is how has that breed changed over the last 50 years? And so this goes to 2017, so it's right in the process now of being updated. But if you look at that black line with the little squares that starts in the bottom left and goes clear to the peak of the top right, 
that's our Angus breed. That shows you how much that breed has changed over the last 50 years in terms of yearling weight and the trend to increase yearling weight. And you can see it's, it's gone way past all of our other breeds in terms of trend or growth that we put on the cattle in that breed as an average. If you look at um, the bottom line, that, that kind of reddish or tannish bar with squares, open squares, that's the Hereford breed. You can see they've grown as well. Um, if we look at the green line with the triangles, that's a Simmental breed. And, and we often think of Simmentals as being the big frame um, uh, dual type breed that was started as a, a milking and a meat breed. But if you look at that line, it's kind of leveled off. So as, an, as a breed industry, the Simmentals have really slowed their yearling growth rates or change where our Angus has continued to grow it. So again, that point, if we can find good bulls in every breed that fit our needs, but to think that our Angus are our old moderate type animals, they're not anymore. And I think our next slide looks at carcass weight and you see a very similar trend. So the key is to kind of look at the slope of those lines in terms of growth. And we see the black line, the Angus has continued to increase the green a triangle line is our Simmentals, and it's been really pretty steady over the last 20, 30 years. So um, again, our, our, our breeds are not what they used to be. So if we start off, this is oversimplified, and I think this really dovetails in what Denise was just saying. Um, these breeds have changed over time. They're doing genetic improvement programs, just like the dairy breeds are. Uh, and there's reasons for that. If you go back to the 70s, I think that first chart went back to the 70s. Like you just said, the continental breeds, the limousine, um, Simmental, they were much larger, almost too large. Angus were much smaller and not that there's not differences now, but the differences probably aren't quite as dramatic. Simmental did what they had to do and get more moderate and Angus did what they had to do and uh, emphasize a little bit more growth. So, um, so that's where we're saying, you know, this is oversimplified, but we know there's differences in breeds out there. Not everything black hided is Angus, right? Uh, many of these other breeds have incorporated the black hair coat color. It may have uh, traditionally been uh, red coat colored uh, breeds. Uh, Simmental and Limousine are perfect examples of that, but others have done that as well. Uh, and then we get into the Simmental. Ryan, you're oh. muted. Ryan must have hit the wrong button while he's finding the right button. I think you can see also what the Simmental and the Limousine breeds as an association have done. Um, by, by expanding their association beyond just the purebreds or the high percentage Simmentals and limousines, but have gone to that Sim Angus program where they actually encourage that crossbreeding of the Simmental Angus. Um, we get a little heterotis, heterosis out of those bulls as well as their calves because of that crossbreeding. But again, that brings in that solid color. It brings in some differences in quality grade and muscling. And the same with the lim limb flex, which is a limousine, typically limousine Angus cross. Um, again, so we get that heavy muscling of the limousine, but we bring in the, the carcass merit and the high quality grades of the Angus as we get into those basically hybrid bulls that then go um, are registered and, and have EPDs on them and fit right into the association. I was just going to ask here, Amanda, I know your family finishes out a lot of dairy beef. What are some other breeds that you, you're you seeing float through your feed yards? Um, yep. So we've actually seen a trend of using Gelby um, as in comparison to some of we they were bringing a bunch of the, the those first calf heifers to Angus and mm -hmm. the bulls that were typically being used weren't necessarily didn't provide us enough growth and muscle shape for our liking. So um, now those heifers are being bred to Gelby bulls, um, which um, Gelby tends to be a little more moderate framed. So it, it mm -hmm. definitely helped in the long run, but definitely also puts a little more um, thickness down over the top and into that round for us to make that, that calf really um, fit better into those beef markets. Right. Um, so that Gelby is going to bring that muscle shape in. It's, it's maybe not going to add or contribute much from a 
a marbling score, but the Holstein has that. Okay. So then it's just finding those Gelby couch bulls that are easy cabbers. And there's, there's plenty of bulls that will, will meet, meet that need as well. It, and exactly. be homozygous black. Exactly. Um, Semitol has also been um, very good for us. One thing that we've noticed with some of the Semitol bulls, especially if they have the blaze face, is we tend to get calves that have a little more white to them. Um, I wouldn't call it excessively white. However, they tend to fall out of that CAB market um, just because they do have that white face and white legs. And I, we may have a slide here later on that we can kind of show of something like that. But an animal that is definitely still fits that type and kind muscle wise, just maybe is gonna fall out of that CAB market um, when mm -hmm. sent to harvest. Mm -hmm. Other, um, we've also seen some Hereford crosses. Um, they tend to struggle putting some of that that muscle on that we've seen. Um, I've also um, have definitely seen Charlet being used. When we talk about the Charlets, we run into the issue of having a smoky calf that still has that Holstein color pattern. They might have um, the thickness and the muscling that we have. They tend to be a little bigger framed than we necessarily like and tend to feed out at significantly higher um, carcass weights, but mm -hmm they definitely add that thickness on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, as we look at it, um, our goal is to sell these cattle into a traditional commodity beef program. Mm -hmm. So if there's indicators on that animal, like big white spots on the ribs, the bellies, those kind of things, um, that's going to cause our beef buyers to back away to say, what breeds are in this animal? Mm -hmm. How is it going to grade out? It just causes that question where if we can take more of the white off, um, especially the, the big blotches of white, they look more like a beef animal as long as we're changing that muscle type as well. Exactly. And one thing that we kind of talked about when we were putting this together is, you know, having that wolf in, in, in the sheep skin kind of yeah. effect. So yes, yes, their mama is, is a dairy cow, but you, you never know it because it's well hidden. Um, and that's, that's just kind of what we're trying to do with some of these calves is, yes, mom's a dairy cow, but can we get that animal to look beef enough, to perform beef enough that we're never going to know the difference? Yeah, you know, one of the questions I get to, or I've seen a little bit is encouraging the use of Wagyu bulls on Holsteins. Yeah. Now, I'm coming from a beef perspective saying, why in the world would we do that? They, they both are high marbling. They both are relatively lean, but they're also both very light muscled. And I don't know if you've seen many of those, um, maybe, you know, but I, I just can't quite get my arms around why that's, that's not a good match in my mind. Yeah, yes. So on our farm, we've, we've fed out, um, some way cute crosses and they just, they don't, they don't hit the mark. Um, I have just jokingly said with Denise and Ryan that you got to really kind of keep them close to the buildings during deer hunting season, because if they're the right size, they look, they're, they're very fine, fine bones, um, light muscled. They could very well be mistaken as something you don't want them to be mistaken as. Um, also, they're, they take a long time to feed out. Um, and for our family, we, we just can't market them with our um, straight beef type cattle and they end up having to be more niche marketed. Um, so if that's a route you wanna go, you know, maybe, maybe that is what you're looking for. But if that's not, and you're just trying to provide a black headed calf, it may be best to stay away from these Wagyu's. Cause even though if, if they come as a black calf or a black wet calf and, and you think you're, you're he's going to fit in with our Angus crosses or Semitol crosses or Lemmy crosses. All of a sudden you get to that two to 300 pound range and you realize that's just not going to happen. Yeah, I think that's a good point. If you're going to use that Wagyu cross, you really need to have a specialty market that's identified before you breed. And that's what you really address. They're not going to fit in up to our commodity beef type systems. Mm -hmm. Ryan, do you have anything you'd like to share? No, I think you covered a lot of it. I think it's, um, again, thinking just not the breed, but the bulls within the breed, you know, matching frame size muscling, you know, where they fall in there. Like the perfect bull in the breed or produced on a Holstein would be moderate frame and improved muscling. 
they're hard to come by, right? I mean, usually we're getting forced to focus more on one or the other trait. That's just the way um, it works. But um, but again, you know, just trying to come back to the uh, basics there. Um, yeah, there's lots of different options out there for breeds. We're not trying to promote one over the other, um, but just some of the generalities uh, there and some of the things that we've seen, you know, how important cold color is in your market or not. And honestly, there's, you know, there's parts in the Midwest that's a very important consideration. We just have to accept that that's uh, part of marketing uh, cross cattle in this part of the country. So again, I think our, our, our beef breeds have really started to do a nice job of helping us better understand what expected progeny differences or EPDs are and create these indexes. So you can kind of think of an index as they've gone through that selection process for us, selected um, a set of EPDs that meet the end market we're targeting, and then weight them a little bit differently. So a lot of them will have uh, a production or a growth type index, um, maybe a carcass merit type index, more of a maternal index. So if we're, we're selecting bulls that we wanna keep replacement heifers out of, and then some will have more of a management. So depending on what um, type of a system you're marketing towards, but this is all based on what kind of product you're trying to market. And maybe one thing that ties in with orders talking about breeds and different bulls and whatnot, there's bulls that might be not the best for beef on dairy. They're not necessarily bad bulls. They were bred for another purpose in mind. They might have excellent maternal traits being used to create mother beef cows out there. They have a purpose, but their purpose not, might not be in this market. And we got to um, keep sorting and weeding through uh, those different lists and just realize that um, that there's those different um, indexes out there. Uh, and that's one tool to sort out which bulls might be a little bit more on the maternal side, which ones might be more on the growth side, which ones might be a little better suited on uh, excelling at the carcass side. Mm -hmm. and, and if we look at EPDs, I think that's the next click. You know, we have lots of EPDs in every breed. They, they vary a little bit, but for most part, all of our breeds are gonna have a calving ease type um, EPD, something reflects yearling and weaning and yearling weight and height and growth, um, a carcass weight, marbling, ribeye. Those are all, all EPDs that every breed pretty much has that we can pick from. So we might use, you know, from a Holstein um, cross system, we might look at either the, the production or the carcass type um, indexes and then add in some of our own guidelines in terms of calving ease or maybe an upper limit. So if we think about yearling height, that kind of reflects that carcass size. We might use that with an upper limit um, that we don't use bulls above this point in terms of trying to reduce that, that mature size. So I think we just wanted to highlight just a couple of the indexes out there just to familiarize yourselves that they're, they're out there. Um, one of the first ones was the Angus beef dollar value. Um, again, focuses more on uh, those growth uh, and carcass traits. And so uh, we have a list down here of, uh, you know, they're including weeding and yearling weight, dry matter intake. Um, they're looking at feed efficiency, just like the dairy industry is looking at feed efficiency, mm -hmm. uh, carcass weight, marbling, whatnot. So kind of the combination of going for growth and also going for uh, the grading, the carcass quality as well. Yep. And this is, as it says up there, it's really targeted those operations that retain that calf all the way through the feedlot and mark it into a, a, a quality grade carcass grid where we're getting a premium for ribeye size, for muscling, for marbling, those kinds of things. Maybe I'll just click right through these, but um, yeah, man, Denise went and touch on Simmental and Limousine have their own versions of it. Yep, Simmental, um, they call it dollar TI or dollar terminal index. And again, um, it's looking if we mate this bull to a mature Angus cow, retain those calves, feed them out, sell them on a grade and yield basis. And then the limousine and limb flex is a, a dollar mainstream terminal index. So that's looking if we use that limousine or limb flex bull on a Hereford Angus cross cow, 
again, feed them out and, and sell into some type of a grid market. And all three of these dollar beef, dollar TI and dollar MTI are basically looking at dollar return. So they do factor in a little bit of what's our current um, fed cattle or carcass um, pricing on fed cattle. So it's looking at how many dollars more should one bull bring you over another. And maybe one difference I throw out there for coming from the dairy world, we think net merit, you can pull up net merit on Holstein, a Jersey, a Guernsey. In the beef world, it's more each breed is farming their own formula, how they best think it feels to their market uh, and promoting their breed to their best advantage. There's not that one necessary homogenous index that's going to cover all beef breeds. Yeah, and we really don't want to compare one breed against another. We, have, we do have the ability, thanks to U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, to look at a crossbreed EPDs, but that's another whole couple hours in itself. So just don't compare each to one breed to another and look within that breed. Um, we do have a question down in the, in the chat box that might be kind of good to answer right now. Um, the question is, are you aware of the accuracy associated with indexes? Are they truly based on carcass characteristics or carcass adjusted gain? And I would say, yes, they are. So accuracy, obviously, the, the older the bull is, the more, si more um, siblings that come out of them, um, progeny that come out of them adds to accuracy. And that is, it, it's not necessarily um, that they're evaluating the accuracy of the index. The accuracy goes to each of the EPDs, and then that gets rolled together within their index. So again, it takes progeny that go through the feed out process, go through the carcass merit, get that all um, submitted back to the breed association that increases the accuracy of ribeye size, of marbling score, of back fat, of carcass weight, and then that factors into our dollar indexes. And just like the dairy, the higher accuracy, the more confident you can be in that bull's ability to change his progeny. So the other thing though that, that the Angus have done and, and it is really focus in on this dairy cross and they've created two new indexes. So it's dollar Angus Holstein is an A AXH and dollar Angus Jersey. So basically it's looking at what's the dollar change of the progeny of this bull, if they're mated with either a Holstein or a Jersey cow to fit into that grid. So it uses that dollar beef index as kind of a starting point, but then it adds some different weighting. It factors in that calving ease that we talked about earlier. So advantage to those bulls that they're, that they can lay down and have their calves easily. It factors in a little of that weaning weight. So that growth up to the weaning stage, especially for our dairies that might be maybe you retain those calves up into that weaning point before you sell them. Obviously it adds extra focus on ribeye score or muscling, but then it, it brings in that maximum height. So from a Holstein standpoint, there's an upper limit on um, that yearling height that goes into the, the Holstein index where the Jersey index, there's no upper limit on, on mature weight because we want them to grow bigger and faster. I think in a couple slides, I have a good illustration um, of some bulls that rank high for both Holstein and Jersey. And uh, mm -hmm. there's one in there that ranks higher on one than the other. And there's a good reason for that. We'll show yeah, you and, and if you see the URL at the bottom, um, this is on the Angus Association's website, but you kind of have to dig a little bit to find it. It's not real prominent. So we, we put that web um, URL in there to help you find that dairy index. Um, the Simitals have done something similar, and they call it the Whole Sim branded program. Um, this actually, you can find this on the Holstein Association's website. Um, they, they've not really created a dollar index like the Angus have, but they have gone in and used um, their, what they call their IGS feedlot profit calculator. So basically, it's looking similarly, how do we add value to the calves based on the, the EPDs of the bulls? 
Um, it's added a few factors that the, these bulls have to be homozygous black and homozygous polled. So they're going to guarantee a black polled calf out of them. Um, they've looked at that direct calving ease, they factored that into here. Um, muscling, carcass grade, again, a maximum carcass length in this case, and moderate growth. So the Simitols tend to be a high growth breed as well. And so they've kind of put an upper limit on it. Um, they, they just have a list of bulls. And so um, these are the, the, what I have on there are the AI sires that were on their list, effective January 1st of 2022. Um, the other link, that little blue box will take you to all of the sires. It, once you see the list and you get the sire um, ID and name, then you can go back into the Simitol Association, search for those sires and see their actual EPDs. Um, the limousines have uh, not necessarily gone into as much direct um, dairy focus as the Angus and the Simitols. Um, so you kind of have to use their dollar um, mainstream terminal index as an indication. And so I just um, went into the Limousine Association and I so they, they have those sorted by their top rank. So I looked at the top 15 or 20 bulls for dollar mainstream terminal index and uh, listed those here. You can see these are the top, um, the, the top number is their dollar index and the bottom number is their percentile rank. So like that first bull, yep, he is in the top 4% of the breed for mainstream terminal index. And you can see the others are in the top two, three or 4%. So these are kind of the elite in the breed for that mainstream terminal index. I would use that if I were looking for a limousine or a limb flex bull, I'd use that as kind of my starting point and say, okay, they're elite for the terminal components of carcass merit, growth, um, back fat, rib eye area, those kind of things. But then I would look at some additional EPDs. So I'm doing this the old fashioned way. And, and you can see on there, um, the calving ease direct. So on a lot of them, you might see calving ease direct or calving ease maternal. The direct is the ability of the bull's um, progeny to be born without assistance. The calving ease maternal would be for his daughters to calve without assistance. So um, in this case, the higher the number, the better. That means more calves are born without assistance. Um, and you can see we've got uh, that second bull there. He is in the top 1% of the breed for calving ease direct. So if I'm concerned about calving ease, he's maybe one of those bulls I'm going to go to because I know he'll, the, the cows will lay down and be able to have his calves. He's very good on dollar terminal index. Um, we can look at some of the others then as we split this, uh, this, this table out as to which ones are going to be better. So um, let's go over to say ribeye and you can see that that top bull has the highest ribeye change. So we'd expect his, his progeny to have a bigger ribeye than say the, the other three bulls. So, um, looking down there, you can see that that bottom bull, he's in the bottom 95% or the bottom 5% of the breed. So if I were using him, I probably would not want to use him on a Jersey or on a Holstein simply because he's not going to change ribeye like the bulls above him would change ribeye. Um, the other thing is if we look at, at carcass weight, so CW or yearling weight, either one of those, and you can see that bottom bull is in the top 10% for ribeye or for yearling weight and carcass weight change. So he's going to make big calves. That's not necessarily what we want on a Holstein cross. Now, it might not be so bad for Jersey, but not on Holsteins, where if we look at, say, the top bull or the, um, the second bull, they're in the lower half, roughly, of the breed for yearling weight and carcass weight. So they would be a better cross on a Holstein. We're going to get better ribeye, bigger ribeyes. We're going to get smaller carcasses or yearling weights. Um, and we're still going to benefit from marbling. They're very high marbling bulls, um, and they're pretty lean. So, so that's how you might take that dollar mainstream terminal index and select bulls that are going to fit on our dairy crosses versus on our um, traditional beef crosses. 
I don't know, you guys want to add anything to that? No, I think it's a really good illustration though of high ranking bulls. There's different ways for them to be high ranking, right? So that fourth bull, again, he's a great growth bull. I mean, he has good traits from that way that helps him get that high overall ranking. He's just not the best choice to use on dairy cattle. Right. And, and I think you, I mean, you said it perfectly, like using that terminal index as a really good starting point, but then possibly digging deeper into some of those other EPDs to kind of get a better understanding of, okay, we have these these top five, now let's get it narrowed down to maybe one or two that better fit our program um, based mm -hmm. off that terminal index and the following EPDs. The, the other thing, and I didn't point this out, but I will now, um, the, the Limousine Association has gone in and identified those animals that are homozygous black and homozygous polled. So you can see the first one is homozygous on that both. The second one, they just have black. So his color's black. He's not necessarily been tested to know if he's homozygous or heterozygous for the color gene, but he is homozygous for the pulled gene. The last bull on there, you can see is heterozygous for pulled. So like, like Ryan said, he's got one pulled gene and one horn gene, and, and it's a 50-50 chance. What are you going to get out of him, the pulled gene or the horn gene? So, well... We got an Angus example too. Do maybe we can just jump right into that and continue on the same train of thought here. Sure. So, so on the Angus bulls, um, what I did is these are ranked based on the dollar Angus Holstein or the dollar Angus Jersey bulls. And again, I went in and, and pulled out say the top twelve or fifteen bulls, and just pulled four of them. So. These are, are the highest ranking Angus Holstein or Angus Jersey bulls. And so you can see that um, that first bull, his dollar Angus Holstein is $271. So basically his calves should bring $271 beyond the average of the breed when they're crossed on a Holstein cow. And if you go across there, um, you can see that, that it, it also ranks very high on the Angus Jersey side. Um, the calving ease direct is, is a plus 11. So that's in the very high percentage in terms of calving ease direct. On theirs, I didn't pull out their rank. They weren't identified that way. So we'd have to go into their percentile of the breed to see how the ranking is. Um, but you can see based on their EPDs. Um, yearling height and carcass weight are again positive. Um, but not near as positive as say that bottom bull at 114 pounds on carcass weight. Um, he, he'd be all right from a Jersey standpoint. And if you look across the line, you see he's, he's probably the highest ranking Jersey bull at 286 or Angus on Jersey um, bull at 286. And a lot of it is because he adds that additional yearling height and carcass weight that those bulls above him don't add. Um, the other thing is they're all very good from a marbling standpoint, so we're not going to make, you know, big choices based on that. But if we look at the ribeye, you know, that second bull is going to have the higher ribeye EPD. So he's going to fit really well to, if we're wanting to add some carcass um, muscle expression to it. And I think, um, you know, I think it, click if, if you click once more, Ryan, we're going to see um, if you're um, selling calves, retaining ownership and selling calves live, you know, we're probably going to look at that first bull as maybe one of our best choices because we know they're going to lay down and calve easy. They're not adding exceptional carcass weight to them, but they are adding marbling and, and they're keeping them fairly lean as we start to, or excuse me, adding ribeye and keeping them lean. And so going into a live market, that's probably a good choice. I think that second bull um, is probably our better choice if we're selling in a grid or a carcass program. So we maybe give a little bit up in terms of, of um, calving ease, but not much. We might give up a little bit in terms of marbling, but we really pick it up in terms of ribeye. And so he might be our best bet to go into a, a carcass um, grid type thing. I did add that little note though. If we look at the carcass weight and the yearling height, they, they have the potential to be bigger, heavier than the, the bull above him. So I'd say those are ones, and, and we haven't really talked about feeding management, but 
that second bull, we probably don't want to put those calves on any kind of a grower system. We want to get them started on feed young and light. We want to try to finish them out in that 1400 pounds as a, a fed Holstein calf or a fed beef calf and not be tempted to take them real heavy because they could get very big on us pretty easy. Um, I think that third bull probably fits if we're selling wean calves. Um, again, it's going to lay down and have that calf. That's the best one we have for calving ease direct. Um, fairly moderate on carcass weight, yearling weight. Picks up pretty nice on marbling and, and uh, moderate in ribeye. So, um, you know, he might fit that, that week old sale kind of system. And then that bottom bull, I think, really fits into a Jersey herd pretty well. Um, again, because of that huge increase in ribeye and that increase in mature weight and carcass weight. So just some ways we can look at four very good bulls on the Angus Holstein and the Angus Jersey indexes, and then how we might select within each of those. Did you um, want to add something, Amanda? So we do have a question in the comments that might kind of fit in good here. So thoughts or comments you might have on calving ease and calf weight and size relative to what the calf buyers prefer when buying calves in a particular in particular at the sale barn. Right, so we're kind of looking at, in that case, cab birth weight, um, and birth weight is an indicator trait of calving ease, right? So if we really wanna look at calving ease, we wanna look at calving ease direct, and as we're looking at that, um, but oftentimes we substitute birth weight. The one thing I would say is um, our, our beef breeds have really had a focus on reducing calving difficulty, just like the Holsteins have. Um, but we've almost gone to the point of where we can get too small a calves, not enough bigger. Um, part of that small birth weight comes from a shorter gestation period. So I kind of look at birth weight similar to carcass weight and yearling height that there's kind of a threshold and, and it's not necessarily a set one, but I probably don't want the smallest birth weight calves, bulls, EPDs um, to go into the dairy program because I want to have a little vigor. I want to have a little growth. I want to have a little bit of size to those calves. I want them to come out easy, but I don't want those 40, 50 pound calves because especially if you're going into that, um, if you're selling them in that wet calf market, they got to have a, enough gumption, enough oomph to really hit the ground and, and start growing well. And Amanda, I think your family has bought a lot of wet calves. What, what's your view on that? Um, so yeah, it, it, you're exactly right. Um, and when we meet back here after lunch, um, the next group will talk a lot about like that calf care and why that's important. But having some size to those calves and having a calf that's going to get up you know, look for that bottle for that colostrum um, and it's just going to take off and keep growing is huge. Um, also, sometimes when we get these calves that are that small, we lose a lot in performance just throughout the entire lives of that calf. Um, mm -hmm. They just, they don't tend to necessarily catch up to the rest of those calves that are their same age. They tend to fall back into those younger categories or younger groups of calves. And especially if you want to keep a uniform group of calves together, you run into some issues with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's the other place where we look at, um, you know your cow herd, evaluate your cow herd. If your, your cows can easily lay down and have big, healthy Holstein calves and they can just pop them out without any difficulty, I would not put too much selection pressure on calving yeast direct or birth weight because your cows are big framed and they can do that. Now, if you have a dairy where, where maybe because of pelvic shape or um, um, high performance, maybe that those, those Holstein cows have a hard time having a calf or you've had more calving difficulty, then I'd put more pressure on that calving yeast direct to make sure um, that those calves can pop out. Remember, birth weight is only one factor that may affect um, dystocia issues. Um, front end structure. So I'm thinking mostly head, neck, shoulder structure can have a huge impact um, in terms of the ability of that calf to come out. So that's kind of what's in that calving ease direct number. And again, we may not want to put a lot of selection pressure on them. Jerseys, you might want to put more on. 
So I would actually, I mean, yes, you may want to, but there's been a Jersey can lay down and have a pretty good size calf. Okay. So I wouldn't, wouldn't focus too much on that as well. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. if you're going to breed some Jersey heifers, you may want to, but Jersey cows are, are pretty mighty little critters. Um, when it I comes would agree to with that. that. Um, they're just had, yeah, I mean, but we see it, our observations too in the calf alleys, the lightweight calves do go at a discount sometimes, especially more recently. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a happy medium to be found, right? Not too small, not too big. Um, remember talking to a, a producer that uh, they started breeding for bigger calves and they got a bigger one. They had a 120 pounder. Um, unfortunately, they got zero dollars for that calf because it was stillborn. Um, so, you know, you can go too far in either extreme. I think a lot of this comes back to uh, Amanda, Bill, and myself. We did some survey work when this first started picking up pace a few years ago uh, on sire selection, and it, the answers were all C's. It was coat color, it was conception, um, cost, and calving ease. And I think a little part mm-hmm. of it is nobody wants to get blamed for selling the bull that caused a calving problem. So there might have been a little overcompensation for it. But I think that's a good point to talk about the extremes, Ryan, because we want to focus on calving ease, but we don't want that to be our sole focus. So like you said, a lot of these cows can lay down and have 90 to 100 pound calves without a problem. So it's, it's maybe where do we put that limit? Do we, you know, stay in the top 30% of the breed for calving ease direct is adequate. We don't need to get those bulls that are in the top 10% of the breed. So, so thinking about identifying your cow herd and how that all fits together. The other thing I wanted to, to build on what Amanda mentioned and what your next session is going to be. Um, but since this is more of the dairy audience today, um, that newborn calf care from a beef calf standpoint is critical because we know if those calves do not get adequate colostrum, the bull calves, day one, they're not going to have the health status all the way through finishing. So really, really, really need to stress that those bull calves need the same kind of care as your replacement heifers do. Um, We do have one question in the chat that I did want to catch before we get um, to our summary. Do you think the use of beef embryos on dairy cows will be feasible in some dairies in the medium to long term, both from a management and an economic standpoint? Um, I would just say, I think from a, a management of that calf through market, um, yes, because basically we're creating a beef calf. We're just using the dairy cow to carry it, right? Um, so I think that is a op- opportunity. And I think there are dairies that are looking at doing that. The economic part of it, I'm not sure I can really address that. And I think it depends on the size of the dairy, the number of cows that you're going to have coming in heat, um, the number of the, the number and source of embryos that can go into it. I think the economics has a ways to go before we get to that. But I think that's a potential and I know it's starting to happen. So yeah. And we've asked a few questions on that. We, I, I don't have the answer, but um, look at your IVF costs. It, that does vary. If you're located to a large facility or in-house facility, there might be some cost savings. Some farms are, are finding um, if you're, you know, versus if you're further removed from some of those facilities. Um, we still have to think that those calves are going to be in, raised in a dairy type system. And by that, I mean, they're still going to be bottle fed calves, um, you know, group housing, whatnot, they're not raised by mama cows. So that's a whole other set of economics you have to think about. Can you hand raise that calf uh, just as economically as a mama cow can? Uh, the other thing that it, it's not, I'm gonna say it's not widely available. It's it's available, may, maybe newer or not, um, on as many bulls, the male sorted semen, male sex semen. Um, mm-hmm. We might see that happen first. Um, less of a cost difference there between that and doing uh, IVF. Mm -hmm. And just going back to the whole, um, you know, embryo thing, you really have to analyze is the value of that embryo. And it it depends on what, what your outcome is for that embryo calf. Is he, he or she going to go straight to going to be marketed as a fat animal? Or are we looking to keep it as, 
like a seed stock operation where where like the whole goal of this calf is to make more calves just like itself or is that animal being used as an embryo to be meat some someday sooner um so if you can look at the value of that embryo and decide if the value of that calf once it comes out which way is it going to go and is there value in that i think that's where a lot of this embryo on the economic standpoint we have to kind of think about that yeah i think you i agree totally it, and it it's you kind of got to go back to your partnerships right so okay. if you can build that partnership with a seed stock producer so that you get their high end uh, replacement female or replacement bull um, embryos to put into the dairy process. They, you know, you, you make sure they get treated very well at, at, at birth and get the colostrum. They may go into a seed stock operation. That's where we add value. And at that point, it probably can be economical to do that if you've got that partnership agreement, but just to make commercially available um, steer calves to go into the fed cattle market, we're probably not there from an economic standpoint. But but I, that's one of the items we did list on our summary too. Um, look for opportunities for partnerships. So particularly if um, you're, you're selling those wet calves, uh, there's one thing when they go to a sale barn and they just bring regular commodity prices as a day old or week old calf. But if you can find a partner that's going to take those calves, grow them up, finish them out, add, take advantage of that added value, you get some additional return at that point as well, instead of just unloading those week old calves. Also going off that partnership thing, there are a lot of farms who the calf buyers providing the semen for those dairy mm -hmm. cows so that they can kind of guarantee a little bit better the the quality of calf when they get it back so that's another opportunity there to you know maybe you don't have to make these sire selection decisions maybe you can have a calf buyer that's willing to make that decision as long as you guarantee that calf back to them mm -hmm. yep. i thought i saw another question pop up but did i miss it in the chat is there another one Oh, something about dairy labor. Um, oh, I thought yep. I saw one. So, dairy yep. Labor. So, dairy labor shortage, um, also an issue for raising these cross calves on farm. Need to learn new tips for feeding these beef animals. As Ryan said, can the dairy feed the cross calf as well as a beef mama can? Um, and kind of going back to that embryo thing, especially if you're putting an embryo into a into a, a Holstein cow just to for it to be born. You know, you really have to look at performance of that calf on, you know, milk replacer or as compared to the mama in the long run. And I think that was what Ryan was getting at with that. Well, okay, and then maybe I didn't say as clear as I wanted to. There's they're the same genetics as a full beef, right? We're talking more full beef instead of cross now, but the full beef coming out of the dairy cow bottle raised it's still going to be in a different production system than the full beef that we traditionally talk about. But I think you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there's still a big cost difference there. Um, so you have to recoup that somehow in, in the marketing, whether it's because you know what those genetics are, there might be potential, you know, short term down the road here to still do this, you know, on a feedlot setting, but you're doing it because you know, so that's the can of cattle I want. I know how they're going to perform. Again, you have that insider information on what the genetics are behind them. If you're marketing um, calf alley, you're just going to get commingled with any other black calf out there. You're losing that value added part. So how do you recoup that extra cost then? Um, so there's that, again, there's that marketing tie of, um, yes, you might know a little bit more information about that calf. It's different genetics, but how does that not get lost downstream uh, if and when those animals change hands? You got to retain that somehow to recoup that value. Kind of going back to that nature versus nurture thing as well.
So I know I jumped ahead to the summary slide, but we already, I think we already hit on half these points here. So mm -hmm. that was good timing. Um, but yes, I mean, sire selection isn't the only thing. There's calf care and, um, and those things are going to be talked about in the, the next four uh, sessions. Um, but I think, again, no matter how you're marketing, uh, we want to emphasize um, we want to get away from the black Holstein air quotes of where early on, you know, if we just made a black calf, um, yes, it added value to it and people are willing to pay that. And that's where even if you're not retaining ownership of these animals, uh, still doing some sire selection to breed an animal is still desirable to the beef feedlot industry that they're going to keep coming back for these animals. That's doing the industry a good thing on the whole. Um, and we we hear that from our dairy producers that are acknowledging that now, so I hope that continues. Um, but then again, you know, there might be opportunities to pass that information on to the next buyer, whether uh, you're in a buyback program, whether uh, you have a razor uh, that's providing you semen, those things we just uh, talked about. Uh, again, that, you know, retaining that knowledge about that genetic base is there, uh, and hopefully, you know, a little bit better how those animals are going to perform, compensate for what we lost in the cross versus the Holstein. Uh, we include increased, um, included the genetics for growth um, and ribeye and those things, but we lost the consistency. So we got to make up for that somehow here along in the chain. Anything else, Amanda, Denise, you want to add in there to sum up? I would just add that last point. Um, and I think uh, Bill and the group on next the next session in two weeks will add that. But remember, we want to feed them hard, fast, young, we want to minimize those big giant carcasses. Upper weight limit on the in beef industry is a thousand and fifty pound carcass weight, which is about 1650, 1700 pounds. So um, we want to finish them out prior to that. We want to target that 1400 pound um, upper weight limit as well. Yep, management is key with these mm -hmm. at all stages, which we'll get to that here after lunch. So. And speaking of after lunch, um, pick it up again at 1230, looking at the calf raising protocols. And then again, on March 22nd, uh, looking a little bit more at the feeding older uh, animals and marketing. Uh, if you've registered for this session, the same Zoom link, I do believe, uh, will work again. If you need to contact us, let us know through it in chat, whatnot, or afterwards, this is uh, emails for Denise, Amanda, uh, and myself, um, and again, Thanks to Denise for joining us for Cross State Line State. We didn't get the Iowa State logo on here. Um, the, the Reds might have clashed, but um, <laughs> we still work together quite well. So, um, so with that, I'm going to stop screen sharing. If anybody has questions, um, I know I mean it just sent me a picture. It's just not included right here. We can pull up, uh, but otherwise, uh, throw in uh, your questions here, and uh, we can keep uh, discussing. So if not, thanks for joining us today. I know uh, we bounced around, but um, but that's kind of been the evolution of this, right? As uh, we've talked about this, um, kind of saw what the industry is doing, got that feedback on how those calves are, are performing. Uh, it has helped shape kind of, okay, where we think um, we're gonna start seeing some of this go uh, in the future here.